Welcome. I hope this video finds you doing well. I wanted to take time to do a video today connecting. Let me see if I can uh, change this here. Um, connecting John 1, 1 to 3 and Genesis 1, 1 to 5. This idea is something that has really helped me over the years understand the argument of uh, John 1, and in particular, um, how John 1 is developing Genesis 1. So, uh, let me uh, make sure I've got this running right. Um, so, this is biblical theology today, and we do want to take a careful look uh, into the text, uh, as always, and to see how that text, uh, uh, particularly how the Old Testament is Christologically uh, explained in the New. And so if we do that today, if we look at um, Genesis 1, 1 to 5, John 1, 1 to 5, and we're also going to talk about uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, and then a passage from Psalm 51. Uh, that's uh, David's psalm of confession uh, after he sinned with Bathsheba. What's interesting, and many people have pointed this out, is that uh, when we look at the beginning of the Old Testament, Bereshit, uh, in beginning, Notice that uh, this doesn't have the definite article, so it isn't in the beginning, it's just in beginning. And many people have uh, pointed out that John 1 is following that in RK. If I had had room on this slide, I could have pulled up the Septuagint, and it's clear that the Septuagint, at least in this part of the verse, that John is agreeing with that. And so, and many scholars have pointed um, uh, that connection out, so not really much new there. What's interesting, when we look at the next development in John, uh, we have this very high Christological um, statement. It's, it's not poetry, but it's almost poetry. There, you can see the symmetry. Uh, we have the Logos, and of course, this is probably developing the same idea as the Mimra um, in the Targums, kind of God in his eminence. Uh, uh, the uh, Devar Adonai in the Old Testament, which is God uh, in his revelatory uh, eminence. So the text talks about the Word, and the Word is with God. So those who are trying to argue for some kind of modalistic thing where the eminence of God is God's uh, transcendence just becoming imminence, uh, that's denied by this part of the verse. There, There is a relational aspect here. The word was literally toward God. And then we have the subject here, and the word was God. And many have uh, asked the question, well, you know, why don't you have the definite article here? And some have, you know, said the word was a God. Well, if we look at that same construction elsewhere, uh, particularly Philippians has a very similar um, uh, setup in Philippians 2 where the predicate nominative doesn't have the definite article. And, and even in John itself, you know, what is it, one fourteen? no one has ever seen Theos uh, or Theon there in the accusative. So uh, clearly it's not saying a God, it's saying that what 
God was, the Word was, but it's very difficult to translate uh, what's going on there. And you can see the symmetry of this Logos, Theos, Hutos. This one was, and you can see, well, let me go back. You can see this symmetry here, was, 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 was. And some have pointed out there. there's a, a comparison there between was and became. So all things came into existence, but the Logos was uh, this uh, e eternal uh, 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 entity, this um, this plurality within the unity of God, um, was all of creation comes into being, and you can see the symmetry there uh, in the beginning, <clears throat> and you can see the symmetry here toward um, God. Now. What's interesting about that, and not really much new there, but what's interesting is if you look at this part of the verse and compare it with Genesis 1, well, of course, you have a feature where bara, you know, the only thing bara can mean in Hebrew is he created, he singular, this singular entity created. And of course, in Hebrew, you know, when you have a definite direct object marker, you put this et. So what did this single entity create? Well, he created heavens and the earth. And you might know that all things is simply the Greek way that you would say this phrase, heaven and the earth. So uh, in the beginning, he singular created, he created all things. Well, I'm sure you know that this word Elohim um, is technically a plural word. Uh, Moses uses uh, the singular of it, Eloa, in Deuteronomy, so he, he knew the singular of the word, um, but he chooses to use the plural form. And so we have a he who somehow is also this plural entity. And it's not much of a jump, really, is it? to suppose that this is John's explanation. I imagine as he used this in apologetic uh, um, discussions with his uh, Jewish friends, um, he said, hey, you, you know how the rabbis tell us about the Mimrah and God in his eminence? And, and you know how you have all these uh, plurality within unity text? Well, uh, John's going to say, well, let me tell you about the Logos. And the Logos relationally was with Theos, but the Logos was Theos. And apologetically, if, if that's John's argument, um, that's a very powerful argument. Uh, in Scripture, of course, Alan Siegel has the whole uh, book, uh, Two Powers in Heaven, you can look at Logos, uh, at Philo and his dis discussion of the Logos, and um, all of these passages that Jews would um, talk about in terms of plurality within the uh, base unity of God. It seems to me that that's what's going on in this text. Notice John is careful to say that nothing, not even one thing of, of all this came into existence apart from the Logos. Uh, the, the Logos uh, through him, and of course, if you go to the end of Romans 11, that through him passage is applied to just God generally. All things are from him and through him and to him. And if you look at First 
Corinthians uh, 8, 4 through 6, you have the Shema there, excellent uh, PhD dissertation at Oxford. Paul Rainbow um, uh, talks about the monotheism, and it's clear uh, in scholars who suggest that uh, Paul is splitting the Shema. It seems to me that that's exactly what is happening Very interesting text uh, when we, just as a side note, when we look at David's uh, discussion in Psalm 51, notice uh, in his sin he says, uh, a lave tahor, uh, a pure heart, bara for me, O Elohim. And it seems like he's uh, mimicking this verse and saying, it's not that I'm a good person and I do bad things. It's I, I need a new heart. I need a pure heart. Oh, Elohim, I need you to speak uh, a new heart into uh, existence for me. I'll never have a pure heart unless you create it for me. And, of course, Jesus uh, picking that up and saying the pure in heart will see God. Well, how, how do you get a pure heart? Well, God uh, creates it. So... Very rich interaction there, but it doesn't end. Um, When we come to the next bit, um, we we have this statement, what came about in him was Zoe. Now, this Zoe word is really interesting. You know, it's the word life. But it's interesting because in the Septuagint, it isn't, God creates Adam and Eve in the Septuagint. It's God created Adam and Zoe. Um, And what the Septuagintal translators are doing there is simply translating the Hebrew word chava, which chava, sorry, I can't say that het uh, quite rightly. Um, Chava is is the word life. And so the Septuagintal um, writers are simply translating that for the Greek audience. Well, it's interesting, John continuing that exposition of Genesis 1 and 2 is saying that uh, true Zoe was in this logos. And then, of course, we have the anaphoric use of the definite article. So in him was Zoe and the Zoe, or maybe in English we could even say this Zoe or this Zoe that I'm talking about was in him. Um, It's at least worth a look to um, go and see how Proverbs 8, 22 to there through the end of the chapter uh, with wisdom and wisdom being God, at God's side uh, in creation. That connection's worth a look. And of course, you know, the Targums, one of, one of the Targums translates, you know, God in wisdom uh, created or something similar to that. Or, um, you know, some have even argued God as wisdom, uh, reading that as a bait essentiae. But it's clear that John is somehow developing that idea that <clears throat> this entity, this redeemed entity that was redeemed by God and the lamb being slain before the foundation, that somehow that entity is existing Um uh, in the Logos uh, is part of that creative work. Now, it's interesting to me that when you look at the Hebrew side, um, we, we have this statement, and did you see the inversion there? Uh, here it's heavens and earth, but then when he begins to talk of that, uh, he inverts uh, and goes to the earth. The earth was tohu va vohu. And what's interesting about tohu va vohu is if you look at that phrase as it's used elsewhere in the Bible, I think it's used in uh, Jeremiah of 
the land after it's been completely uh, destroyed by the Babylonians. It says the land was Tohu Vabohu, and uh, uh, it talks, Tohu Vabohu is a negative uh, thing, the plumb line of confusion, um, similar places uh, where that's used. But clearly, the when God created everything, it initially looked very bad. It looked like it was under judgment. It looked like it was in utter chaos. And then the seven days of creation are God bringing order to that uh, primordial uh, chaos. And you wonder if John is seeing this as some kind of meta-narrative uh, elegance where God comes to something dead, dark, without form and void. Um, you know, and you look at darkness is universally negative uh, in the Hebrew Bible. And Tehom, in all but, at least as I look at it, one place, uh, it's universally negative. It's the fountains of the deep that break up and flood the world in uh, Noah's day. I, I think if my memory serves me well, um, uh, Tehom may be in the crossing of the Red Sea when God splits the Red Sea and creates dry land. And you think, oh my goodness, it's kind of a development of uh, creation. You have the decreation, the 10 plagues decreating the Egyptian world, just as God threw 10 words in Genesis 1, you know, and Elohim said that appears 10 times. Um, God created the world through 10 words and he decreated uh, Egypt through these 10 words. And, and the Tehom is there. And of course, in the original, uh, sorry, uh, not the original, in the uh, Septuagint translation, you have the word abusos, the abyss. And uh, that's the word in Luke, I think it's Luke 5 in the Gadarene Demoniac, where the, the demons are terrified of the abyss and beg Jesus not to send them to the abyss. And of course, that abusos is translated bottomless pit um, in Revelation. And so the enemies, those who don't want God's rule, um, eventually they're thrown into the abyss. And so when you think of that, these are negative elements, uh, if you will, kind of negative elements in pre-fall creation that are being conquered. Um, and what's interesting is it seems to me that John is contrasting that light and the darkness that um, it's God speaking. God, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. In New Jerusalem, it is uh, the Lord God and the Lamb who are the uh, light. And New Jerusalem is basking in that light of God. But here, uh, it seems like John is reading that in terms of foreshadowing salvation, that somehow God creating light uh, or the Logos as the light or the Logos as wisdom uh, in the light. I don't really know exactly how John was thinking through that, um, that that shines in the darkness. Um, and notice that then we have this really interesting phrase that the Ruach of Elohim was pale, intensely hovering over the face of the water. Now, what's interesting about the Ruach, they're coming to this waters of the abyss, is when you have the crossing of the Red Sea, the Ruach appears again. I think it's translated east wind there, but it's uh, God's Ruach. I think it's in Exodus 15, um, divides the abysmal waters of the Red Sea and creates dry land. And you can think of that as kind of mimicking original creation. And John, I wonder if he isn't developing that and saying the light of all humanity 
um, shines in the darkness and the darkness did not take it down and you can do that take it down kind of lombano uh, mentally but I, I think it's uh, john 12 uses that overcome and i would favor that here the darkness did not overcome it so you you have uh, this light as logos and somehow eve bound up in the logos uh, coming and conquering the darkness. And uh, if we see plurality here, particularly developed kind of in a Benetarian way uh, in the Logos and Ton Tha'an, it's clear um, with the Ruach Elohim that... Uh, we're not simply talking about a duel of Elohim, El Elohim, or whatever that would be, but it's a true plural Elohim, um, more than two. And that uh, Benetarianism clearly includes a spirit, so you get a Trinitarian. So. I wonder if John isn't coming to this statement and Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light as foreshadowing this salvation that uh, God is bringing. Uh, Elohim saw the light. So notice we've got the anaphoric uh, use of the definite article there. And then God caused a division. Of course, that... Uh, Badal word, um, God divided between light and darkness. He divides between the abysmal waters and the salvific space between those waters. Um, Elohim is the one who made a div caused a division. Of course, all this language is used, uh, similar language is used in the uh, tabernacle. So you have the veil dividing the holy place from the holy of holies. And it seems like uh, Genesis is uh, picturing this as a heavenly uh, temple. All of creation is somehow a universe, is holy of holies or something. Then we have Paul doing the same thing. I think this is 2 uh, Corinthians 4, 6. Um, and I think I've got this slide where it will move up a little. Um, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Um, and um, God saw the light that it was good. Uh, and God caused a division between the light and between the darkness. And God called to the light. Notice we have the definite article there, um, Yom. So what is the light call is Yom. And to the darkness, he called Layla. So, what do we? What did he call that? Uh, we call the darkness Layla. What's interesting is when Paul interprets that in Second Corinthians four six, um, for the God having said, "Light will shine." So that's kind of interesting. Um, most people are going to read that as adjustive. And it's interesting that um, uh, Paul is um, reading that as a future. Um, there are some technical things that better scholars than me will explain in terms of maybe some Aramaic background uh, there. Um but it's clear that he's reading this passage in Genesis. He's reading this as somehow uh, being an actual factual historic event, but also one that's somehow foreshadowing God's uh, elective work in salvation. Uh, the God, the one having said, from light, uh, from darkness, light will shine, that God is the one. Uh, I guess you have to add the word is here, is the one who has shown, Arist, in our hearts for the enlightenment 
of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So this so is my video for today, a connection uh, between Genesis 1 and John 1, um, reading Elohim uh, as a plurality within a unity, and then um, uh, also reading that actual factual historic event is pointing beyond itself to a greater uh, spiritual truth. Well, um, interested as always uh, in your comments. Um, uh, so let me know. Look forward to um, seeing you next time.